In this video, we're going to look at an overview of the various structures that are part of the lymphatic or the immune system and what their main functions are. So in this diagram, I want to point out a few structures that are important for the lymphatic system and the immune system. Um, first, we have our bone marrow. The red bone marrow contains hematopoietic stem cells that will differentiate into, into either red blood cells or white blood cells. We have all kinds of lymphatic vessels. All of these little green lines here are lymphatic vessels and they are important for carrying fluid from the interstitial space back into the circulatory system. And if we have a look down here at how the lymphatic vessels drain back into the cardiovascular system, we have different regions of the body that drain into different places. So the right lymphatic duct is going to drain into the right subclavian vein. And you can see up here that that includes this sort of upper right hand portion of the body. Whereas the rest of the body is going to drain into the thoracic duct, which drains into the left subclavian vein. Now, as the fluid is moving through all of these lymphatic vessels, they are also moving through lymph nodes. So we have a bunch of different lymph nodes and we'll look at what's inside of those. We have a thymus. Up until about the age of puberty, um, our thymus is quite active where we are helping T cells to mature. And then we have other lymphatic tissues like our tonsils and adenoids. We have a spleen which also acts kind of like a big giant lymph node. It has a lot of white blood cells and it also contains red pulp where it helps to break down old red blood cells. And then our small intestine contains a large amount of immune cells. We have a lot of lymph nodes that surround the digestive tract because it is an important entry point for some pathogens, right, to enter through the foods that we consume. So we have a lot of immune cells that surround the intestines. And the other part of the intestines and the large intestines that I want to point out is our microflora, which are microorganisms, healthy, beneficial microorganisms that help to protect us as well. So the main functions of the lymphatic and the immune system are to drain that excess interstitial fluid from the tissues back into the circulatory system. The lymphatic system also helps to transport fats. So when we digest fats and proteins and carbohydrates, proteins and carbohydrates are broken down into amino acids and sugars, and they're absorbed directly into the bloodstream. Whereas fats are broken down into fatty acids and glycerol molecules, also our fat soluble vitamins, and they're put into molecules called chylomicrons, and they are absorbed into the lacteals or the lymphatic vessels. They circulate through the lymphatic vessels and then they are put into the bloodstream. Our immune system also, it has to recognize many different types of antigens. So antigens are molecules that the immune system recognizes that could either be foreign molecules like a bacterium or a virus, or it could be self antigens, or it could be benign antigens like cat fur or pollen. Okay, so the immune system has to go through a developmental process, usually within the first few years of life. And our immune system has to learn to recognize pathogens, our self molecules, and molecules that are benign. Also, food molecules, and also our gut bacteria, or our microflora, those organisms, our immune system should not attack those. So the organisms that can cause infection in humans are bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. Now, not all organisms always cause infections, but our immune system learns how to recognize these. And then our immune system also has to learn to recognize pathogens again. So our immune system has memory. We create memory cells so that if we're ever exposed to the same pathogen, we can have a quicker response so that we're not sick all the time. So we can much more easily fight organisms that we have previously been exposed to. So that's immunological memory. So let's look at how the lymphatic vessels take up the extra interstitial fluid. Here we have a capillary network 
right? So arterioles are bringing blood into the capillary network and then venules are taking the blood away. And here we have our tissue cells and in between all of these cells, we have interstitial fluid. So the vascular system is leaky and fluid is going to leave the capillaries and bring nutrients and oxygen to the cells. That excess fluid, some of it will get taken back up by the capillary beds and the rest of it will get taken up by lymphatic vessels. So you can see a few differences between capillaries and lymphatic vessels. These are closed ended vessels. They are still made of endothelial cells, just like our capillaries, but they have these little openings. So when fluid enters the lymphatic vessel, once pressure increases in here, it's going to close that so the fluid can't go back out into the tissue. And then once this fluid moves from the interstitial space into the lymphatic vessel, then it is called lymph. So when the fluid is in our capillaries, it's called plasma. Then it moves into the tissue and then it's called interstitial fluid. And then once it moves into the lymphatic vessel, then it is called lymph. So it is basically the same fluid, but it has a different name depending on its location. And then that fluid is going to move along the lymphatic vessels. Remember before how we talked about how blood moves through the, the veins back to the heart and we had two major factors. So the skeletal muscle pump. So whenever we contract muscles, it pushes blood through the veins and then there's valves that prevent it from flowing backwards. And then we had the respiratory pump. So when we breathe in, we change the pressure in our thoracic cavity and that helps to pull blood through those vessels back to the heart as well. Those two factors also impact drainage through the lymphatic vessels. So the skeletal pump and the respiratory pump help fluid move through the lymphatic vessels as well. And then the lymphatic vessels, the larger lymphatic vessels, also have smooth muscles that will contract. And then there can be like a peristalsis kind of movement that pushes the fluid through those vessels. And lastly, lymphatic vessels also have valves that prevent the fluid from moving backwards. So the fluid moves through the lymphatic vessels and goes back to the subclavian veins and then rejoins the cardiovascular system. So the bone marrow contains pluripotent stem cells, which means they have the ability to differentiate into any of the blood cells, the red blood cells or the white blood cells. The white blood cells are the immune cells and we have a bunch of different kinds. And we also call these hematopoietic stem cells because they're producing the blood cells. So let's just have a little bit of a look at the lineage of some of these cells in the bone marrow. So we have stem cells in the bone marrow, specifically the red bone marrow. We also have yellow bone marrow, which stores fat. So the red bone marrow is where we have these hematopoietic stem cells. There are two main lineages the myeloid stem cells and the lymphoid stem cells. So the myeloid pathway, these can develop into red blood cells, which carry our oxygen, and then our mast cells, which is a type of cell that will produce histamine. It's involved in tissue repair and allergies. And then we have our basophils, neutrophils, eosinophils, and monocytes. These are part of the innate immune system. So these are non-specific immune cells that will have very specific functions. So basophils, for example, are involved in allergic reactions. Neutrophils are kind of like our first responders. So we will look at that more closely in the next video. And then monocytes, I want to point out, are immature cells that can differentiate once they become um, in contact with an organism, a pathogenic organism, then they can differentiate into a dendritic cell or a macrophage. And these are very important cells, which we will look at again in the next video. Megakaryocytes are part of our bone marrow that will differentiate into thrombocytes, which we also call platelets. And platelets are involved in blood clotting. So that is our myeloid stem cell pathway. 
the lymphoid stem cell pathway differentiates into our lymphocytes. And these are the cells that can develop immunological memory. And again, we will talk about this in the immune system video called adaptive immune response. So we have natural killer cells um, and then small lymphocytes that are going to develop into our T cells and our B cells. B cells are the ones that make antibodies and they can differentiate into plasma cells and produce tons of antibodies. Now the B cells and the T cells, they have to differentiate. So those cells are very specific immune cells. So the macrophages, for example, they're non-specific. They will generally recognize a pathogen Whereas our B cells and T cells, we have millions of them that we produce during embryonic development and early childhood. And those cells have very specific receptors that each will bind to a very specific antigen. Okay, so they have to go through a very special developmental process because we don't want our immune cells to attack ourself or our microflora or benign substances like food right? So the B cells and the T cells have to go through a maturation process. The B cells do this in the bone marrow and the T cells do this in the thymus. And this is important because any of the B cells and T cells that are produced that recognize self antigens or benign antigens, they will be destroyed through a process called apoptosis. Okay, so now we know that this system is not perfect. And sometimes we can still have B cells and T cells that might react to things we don't want them to. So what do you call it when your immune cells attack one of your tissues? Then we have an autoimmune disease, right? So if your immune system attacks you, that is a type of autoimmune disease. When your immune system attacks a benign substance like cat fur or peanuts, right? Then that is an allergy. Okay, so an allergic reaction is when our immune system fights something that is not actually harmful to us. So next I want to look at the lymph nodes. So as the fluid leaves the capillaries, goes into the interstitial space, and then it gets taken up by lymphatic vessels, that fluid then doesn't just get dumped right back into the cardiovascular system. As it goes through the lymphatic vessels, it goes through lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are very important because they act like really cool filters in our body. So as our fluid is moving through the lymphatic vessels, moving back towards the heart, it is going through all kinds of lymph nodes. Now inside each lymph node, we have lymphoid follicles, and these lymphoid follicles contain our lymphocytes, like our B cells and our T cells. There are also reticular fibers, which is just a protein fiber that's a type of connective tissue that will act like a filter. And we have valves in our, in our vessels so that the fluid can only drain in one direction. The afferent vessels are bringing the fluid into the lymph node and the efferent vessels are bringing the fluid out. So notice that many lymphatic vessels can drain into the same lymph node. And it is these lymphocytes inside of the lymph node that are going to play a really important role in filtering this fluid, recognizing pathogens and getting rid of dead cells and debris and basically cleaning up that fluid before it goes back into the cardiovascular system. And then we have a spleen. So our spleen contains red pulp and white pulp. And the red pulp regions are for breaking down old red blood cells. Our liver also does this so you can actually live without a spleen. So these white pulp regions contain cells like macrophages and dendritic cells as well as B cells and T cells. And then we have lymphatic nodules, which are kind of like lymph nodes, except they don't have that connective tissue capsule. So lymphatic nodules would be things like your tonsils and your adenoids. And then, like I said earlier, our digestive tract has a lot of immune cells. So we have the gut associated lymphatic tissue, and this includes things like Peyer's patches, which are regions of immune cells. Okay, so the digestive system and the respiratory system are major entry points for pathogens that we either consume or we inhale. So we're going to have more lymph nodes and lymphatic 
nodules in areas of the body where pathogens can enter. The last thing that I want to point out is that the digestive system has microflora or microorganisms. We have bacteria and some yeast organisms that live in the digestive tract and they are extremely important for helping to regulate our immune system. People during early years of life, say before the age of two, if you take an antibiotic, let's say you have an ear infection and you need antibiotics, then Antibiotics can kill a lot of microflora, which can actually, without probiotics, it can increase the probability of allergies and autoimmune kinds of reactions. So our microflora in our digestive tract is really, really important. So probiotics are always a good idea. And these help to regulate the immune response. So if we lose the diversity of microfloral organisms in our digestive tract, it can impact how our immune system deals with pathogens or inflammatory reactions. And your microorganisms have a ton of other functions like helping us to digest food and getting rid of carcinogens and they even help our mood. So having healthy gut bacteria, even though it's not a specific structure, I wanted to just mention that it is a very important part of our immune system. So here's a summary of all of the structures and their important role in our immune functions.